All right then, Natasha, first question. Okay, there are three questions here that are quite similar, so I'll just combine into one. How can one person love his or her enemies if his or her enemies has done the worst things to him or her? And then, by also how to forgive if that friend has hurt them very much and that hurt is very painful and very deep. Yeah, and what to do? Turn to your Bibles and we can go through uh, Luke chapter 6, which is what we have uh, covered. Luke chapter 6. Uh, loving your enemies. Because that's the question. Luke 6, uh, verse 27. This is, uh, the question is basically asking about uh, how do we love your enemies. And uh, I, there is a tendency to go to the sermon. Uh, practically, okay, let's talk about practically. You say that uh, how can you love your enemies? How can you love someone who has hurt you so much? How can you forgive someone who has done so much wrong to you? And uh, this can be anything. can be your father, mother, can be your brother, sister, can be your boyfriend, girlfriend, can be... And I want you to understand that it can be your husband, wife, friend, best friend, or whatever it is now, that uh, the hurt can be really... I'm telling you now, the hurt is real, the hurt is deep, and um, it's very hard for you to forgive. And... I would say that it is a miracle because this is actually the most profound miracle in my mind. And I, I find that if you, a person can forgive, uh, if a person can forgive a wrong, I seriously think that that is a supernatural part of God. Yeah. Otherwise, you cannot forgive. Because I can tell you, think positively, I can tell you all sorts of stuff, I can give you six steps to forgive other people, and you can try to do all those things, but you just cannot forgive. And the classic stories, if you're interested, is people like Cory Ten Boom. She had to forgive the guard who was torturing her sister in the camps. But Cory Ten Boom saw the guard and she preached forgiveness. In that same wow. service, she preached forgiveness. The guard came over and said, Fraulein, uh, I'm sorry for what I've done. I, I've now believed in Jesus. Can you please forgive me? In her heart, Cory Ten Boom said, I cannot. I really cannot. God, I cannot. I can forgive anybody. But this man tortured my sister and she died in the camp. I cannot forgive him. But you see, now here's the part. It is actually a command from the Lord that you must forgive. So we say that God, I want to obey. Here's the part, okay? If you say this is the part, you must say that I want to. Because I want to obey God. And then the next part is God help me. So Cory Temple basically said, God help me, all I can do. Okay, this is a very simple. The guy in that case only extended his hand. So the question is, do you take his hand? Should you? I cannot. Should you? I cannot. Should you? Yes, I should. Because God told me to forgive my enemies. So for example, I said, I'm, I'm just going to lift my hands to God, you do the rest. The heart still don't want to let go. The heart don't want to let go. Okay? And she extended her hand, and she wrote this. Okay? This is from her words. She said that electricity flowed from her body. The two of them cried. They hugged each other. She felt a huge burden of bitterness left her body. And then she never realized, because sometimes you don't actually realize this, you know. In your heart, right, you are actually very, very, very bitter. You function the same as normal. Everything looks okay. You don't think about it. You function normal. But once you actually go through that process, right, you realize how much you actually hate, how much you are actually so bitter. And then once you actually forgive, right, it is just... And then, yeah, it's so good. Now, Corey then later on said that, I mean, because uh, people ask this question, people... because. It's good for you guys if you can read that book. Because you talk about an entire nation being tortured, an entire nation losing their loved ones. And now you're saying people have to forgive. And she did so. And people keep asking her those questions. How can you forgive people who kill my father? How can you forgive someone who raped my sister? How can you forgive someone who go and kill my child? How can you? And, and yet, because by the grace of God, they can. So short answer. Should you? Yes, you should. Do you? How do you do it? You obey God. If this means, for example, that uh, love your enemies as how you would treat them, okay, treat, treat others, you do things that you, you may not want to do. Meaning that you like cake, you buy cake for them, you try to treat them nicely, you love your enemies. These enemies may say that, how, how come you treat me so well? And the best thing that can happen is your enemy becoming a friend. All right? Now, if that is too painful for you because you find that all the hurt, um, again, ask God, God will lead you slowly. I'm not saying that you immediately jump in, 
And I'm not saying that you should purposely get yourself hurt. But what I'm saying is that if you do not handle this part of your life, you will carry it through. I know people who are bitter for 5, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. I know people who are still angry at their parents and their parents have died. You understand that or not? They are still angry at their parents, but their parents have already died 10, 20, 30 years ago. So they carry the bitterness all through their life. All right? So don't let that happen to you. And this is, I think, what Jesus is talking about. Huh? So there's a lot of things to talk about on forgiveness, but we, we move on first. Uh -huh. Alright, another popular question here is, how to know it's God's voice ah. through answered prayers? Good. That's great. That's or, how, or rather, how to know it's God's plans, or how do you know God is answering us in that, in that particular way? Mm. This is a very common question, and um, it actually is answered also by uh, Pastor Ming Hui when, she, when he was over here. How do you hear God's voice? Um, number one, the Bible. Yeah. All right. And why do I say the Bible? I need this to be very clear to you. Because all the other methods are depends on the Bible. You may hear voices, you may see dreams, you may... Uh, have confirmation from your friends, you may have uh, uh, pastors saying that this is the right way for you, and you have, may have parents supporting you, and you have all those other things, but the main one to confirm is the Bible. For example, should I divorce my wife because I like another girl? Hmm. God, please give me an answer, but I don't want to read the Bible. God, please give me the answer. My heart feels at peace. Oh, no. <laughs> your heart is deceptive. I ask my friend, go like your wife treat you miserably, you know, your wife are very bad to you. Then. Mm, yeah, no. Go to the pastors. I don't know what the pastors teach. Pastors say, mm, God wants you to be happy. Then you go and dream. And you have a dream where you're with this new girl in the beach somewhere, very happily. God, thank you for answering my prayers. Cannot. Cannot. Because the Bible says, you cannot divorce your wife. You are already joined together. Two have become one flesh. When you separate, you're actually committing adultery with another woman. The Bible is clear. Open your Bible. So you open, and then you see this is true. All right. Now, a lot of your questions are actually not like that. I think a lot of the questions are going more for like, uh, where should I go to study? What course should I do? So it's not like a, a deal, you know that it's right or versus wrong. So if it's those type of questions, uh -huh, now you may get different answers from different people, okay? So this is the Q&A. Mm. Some people may say, okay, do the other things, okay? You have, uh, you pray to God, you have peace in your heart. All these things I think is okay. You, you, you ask people, definitely you should ask people for opinions. But I want to stress over here that there is not there is not necessarily a right answer for some of those questions. For questions of right and wrong, right, there is a right answer. There is a wrong answer. But some of the questions, especially when I talk to uh, people, right, there is no right answer because you can always you see, uh, let's say for example, you this is the, the situation I gave to one of the youth leaders before. Let's say on your right is one decision. On your left is another decision, A or B. And then you say, God, I don't know which one to choose. I study, 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 study. I still don't know which one to choose. I, I pray, I do everything, I still don't know what to choose. Let's say you then flip a coin. Heads, A, tails, B. Because you don't know how to choose, right? So you go to A. And let's say, uh -huh, if it's good, then it's okay. Because you can always say, thank, thank you, God, praise you, God, and so on. Let's say it's the most miserable outcome you can ever have. You lost everything, you, you miserable, your people die, your health is gone, money is gone. It's the most miserable outcome, okay? Between two options. And then you see, and you cannot tahan. Those people who went that way, they became very well, very successful. All these things was good on them. And they're saying, God has blessed them so much. And they say, thank you, God, for not making me choose this way. And you're dead. How are you going to take it? Now, here's the thing. Can God take you out of impossible situations and lift you up? Yeah. Can? Can that is our God? 
no matter how broken, how miserable, how dark, how impossible, you can say it's all right. What's the song goes? Uh, you are nothing is impossible. impossible. Ah. Mm. So even in the most impossible situations, uh, God can lift you up. Okay. Yeah. Now this is a decision between A and B. And let us say, uh, by God's sovereign will, God actually wanted you to be there to demonstrate that He can take you out of impossible situations. So which one is the correct way? Which one is correct? A or B? B, you have a good life, you have everything good, best possible outcome. A is most miserable. But when you choose A, and you find everything collapses, God can still pull you out. And that one may demonstrate God's glory more than the blessings wow. yeah, over right. here. So I tell you, this is very important now. Christians have nothing to fear. When you make decisions, right, you have nothing to fear. Your only question is, am I doing something that honors God or not? Is it right? Is it wrong? If it's wrong, God, I want you to pull me out. If it's right, God, I want to honor you. But in decisions like university, like courses, there is nothing sinful, nothing wrong, nothing evil in choosing accounting or engineering or cooking or physiotherapy. There is nothing evil about it. So, if you don't know which one to choose, you ask God, God may give you peace, God may ask someone to give, uh, talk to you and say that uh, I give you five times bonus on this side, or whatever it is. But if your desire is to honor God, the Holy Spirit will guide you, and when you make the decision, you should not fear. Because right? I think a lot of people are paralyzed, because you're paralyzed because you see, well, God, please answer me, God, please answer me. And then, and then you're waiting for something which other people have testified about. God gave me an answer, and then you, you want what other people have, that, that confirmation, and you're asking God, God, I want an answer from you. But it may not come out, you see. And then you could be paralyzed, and you're so fearful, and you make a decision, and you're scared that the decision was wrong, and then instead of the joyous, triumphant, victorious life where you know that God is sovereign and can bring you out of nothing, you are so scared that you make the wrong decision. So I don't want that to happen to young people. Huh? The only question you have is that, do I honor God? If you honor God, A, B, C, D, E, F. You can go into the fields, the mission fields of Cambodia, go into the mission fields of India, extreme poverty, which is basically what Mother Teresa did. Yeah. And your friends can do all sorts of things and make millions of dollars or whatever. But who says that your life is worse than theirs and their life is worse than yours? Huh? I hope that answers that question. Okay, one here says that why is there an eternal sin when God has forgiven the sins of our past, present, and future? And this person also quoted Mark 3, verse 29. <laughs> Nothing is impossible. <laughs> <laughs> Which one is it? Which one is it? Mark 3 verse 29. Mark 3 verse 29. Oh, the blaspheme against the, uh, the Holy Spirit. Oh, oh, thank you, Zach. just said that thing, I just said the video in that day. Um. The, the eternal sin, okay, this is, uh, if you look up front, uh, there is uh, this, uh, the verse up there, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. He is guilty of an et et eternal sin. So never be forgiven. So this is scary, all right? And uh, for centuries and millenniums, people have been asking, what is the unforgivable sin? So that you know that you will not do it. And... Uh, uh, how to be, how to this, uh, explain this one? Huh? The the unforgivable sin is uh, we can we can try to narrow down the list. Is is murder unforgivable? Has has God forgiven murderers? Yes, yeah, God has forgiven murderers. Has God forgiven uh, rapists? Not in Bible. I don't think in Bible we have. You may correct me. But in the Christian life, in the Christian uh, two thousand years, so. We do have rapists uh, coming into repentance, and then they they are accepted. Uh, does God uh, forgive drug dealers? 
also gone. And drug dealers, remember what they are? They are people who uh, destroy, I use the word strongly, they destroy the lives of, of families, of many, many people. Uh, one example was, I think, Teddy Kung, uh, the gangster in Hong Kong, and then uh, he converted. And then uh, when his conversion story is quite interesting also because he did not believe in God, but he also feared that he would go to hell. Because when he saw the drug addicts and so on, he knows that he was responsible partly because he sells drugs. He is responsible for all those people being addicted to drugs and uh, basically destroying their own lives. So he was fearful as well. But um, God spoke to him in very powerful ways um, and answered his uh, prayers. And he became a pastor. He, he, he let go of all these other things around him. And uh, he started a church. And uh, yeah, he, he became a believer. So when you look into all that, right, you have uh, murderers, rapists, drug dealers, gangsters, all these, you know, probably the most wicked of wicked people, huh, all on that side. And you say that God is still able to forgive them. Then you have not so much... There are two things over here. One is that you have nothing to fear, maybe, because you're not going to do all those things. So whatever that you do, I can almost guarantee you, uh -huh, whatever you do, God can forgive. Okay, I think that is very, very important for you to hear. God has forgiven murderers. God has forgiven uh, gangsters. God has forgiven drug dealers. So unless one of you guys over here is going to do all three all together, even then, even then, you come to repentance before God. And uh, you have the sub-clause, which is that you will bear, you may bear the consequences of your actions. But you will still be uh, part of God's kingdom. No? I mean, you may be jailed, you may be sentenced to death. Um, the story of the drug dealer in Indonesia, he repented and he received Christ in jail. And in Indonesia, if you deal in drugs, what's the punishment? Death sentence. So he was, I think, either hanged or shot, I can't remember it. And then, uh, but he, when he walked to the execution ground, he was, I think he was singing Amazing Grace, if I remember correctly. So this is one assurance for all of you. No matter how bad you are, no matter how evil your actions were, you can, God can forgive. All right? Then what is this question? This question, whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven, he is guilty of an eternal sin. One answer, and I don't want to go through the different, different answer, is that if you know that this is actually God's work, all right? if you know that uh, your salvation, for example, or the, or the miracles that you see around you, and, and or the testimonies that you heard, and you know in your heart, you actually know, okay, I'm not saying that you are you're not sure you are guessing, you're exploring. I'm saying that you know. So if you know that this is actually God's work, but in sheer rebellion, you testify that it is the work of the devil, that it is the work of Satan, even though you know that it is God's work. Um, what happens is that is one explanation, is that uh, you have blasphemed against the Holy Spirit because you have uh, turned against God deliberately, uh, not deliberately. You know it is God, but then you deliberately choose to to give credit to the devil. And uh, I think what happens over here is uh, let me just uh, go to Hebrews, lah. Hebrews. Uh, just just for a while, lah. Huh? Just see whether I can get an answer from Hebrews. Uh, if I cannot have it. Um, <laughs> Hebrews is actually a very good part to answer this question as well. Because uh, Hebrews has that part about, has another difficult question. It's, uh, no, I don't think I can find it in time. Mm. It's the one that says that uh, uh, you have uh, the assurance of salvation one. It's, it's the one that's... Hebrews 10, is it Hebrews 10? Hebrews 10, Hebrews 6. Hebrews 10, 6. 
Okay, not really. Okay, not really. There's another one. But what happens is that um, there is one passage which I can't um, recall where, where it talks about the one of the most scary things you may have, okay? Because I think you, you may be concerned about this one. What happens when you are uh, from Hebrews is that if you are so far gone, if you are so far gone huh, that you are away from Christ, because you're saying that I'm scared that I cannot come back. What happens if you're so far gone, the Hebrews say, the writer says that you cannot repent. You don't have the ability to repent. So as long as you can repent, it's a sign that you are still able to be saved. But if you find that you cannot repent, then uh, it's a sign that uh, you have a serious problem. Uh, you just cannot. You, your, your heart is hardened to such an extent. Repentance is a very good thing. So for example, if you sin, you continue to sin, and you find it difficult to repent, your first thing should be, God, help me to repent because I just cannot. And you ask God, help, 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 and then God helps, gives you a heart that's broken, and then you can return to God. If you cannot repent and you have no desire to repent, you are too far gone. Huh? It's in Hebrews 6, 4. Hebrews 6, 4. Ah, yes. Uh, Hebrews, uh, is it up there? Yeah. yeah. Oh. <laughs> Very efficient. So what do we have? For it is impossible in the case of those who once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, and have shared in the Holy Spirit, and tasted the goodness of the word of God, and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away to restore again, them again to repentance. So you see, yeah, it is impossible, because what happens is that you have already tasted the heavenly gift, you have already shared the Holy Spirit, you have already tasted the goodness of the word of God, and you have already tasted the powers of the age to come. And then, and then you fall away and restore them again to repentance, uh, since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own heart. What happens is that you cannot repent. Huh? You just cannot repent. So that's quite scary. So just to close this question, what happens is that all the sins, that one, don't worry, because you probably will never commit those other sins, but you can commit lesser sins, and you still don't want to go to God. And then you still deny and reject and then uh, condemn and curse God. Huh? But as long as you can repent, you also should not be worried. Huh? Okay, I think I spent a lot of time there. Okay, next. And next, which I think is quite interesting. Mm. Why did God send Jesus when he is capable of sending another person or another thing to die for our sins? Because Jesus is part of the Trinity. Trinity means that the, in the beginning of creation, uh, there was already, before creation, there was already God, Jesus, and the, and the Holy Spirit. So when you talk about that, you need something, when you talk about the sacrifice, you need a perfect, perfect being. And there's nobody perfect. All right? You can create another human being, but another human being has already had the sin of Adam. Talking a bit fast because uh, I want to go through some more questions. But what happens is that there's only, one, there's only one man who can actually be sacrificed on the cross. And that is only the perfect man. Son of man, son of God. All right? So nobody else can. The most holy of a person, the most holy religious person under different religion, cannot do that. Because I can tell you this, all of them sin. And as long as you have sinned, you are not perfect for the sacrifice. You cannot wash away the sins. Your blood is, is dark, is dirty. All right? So what happens is that only Jesus, and he was not so much as an afterthought, it was actually part of God's plan to redeem every all creation. All right? It's not just redeem man, it's to redeem all creation through the blood of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Son of God. How do you know you have the Holy Spirit in you? Uh, one way is that you cherish the Holy Word. But then you say, I don't like to read the Bible. So how? Um, you enjoy the fellowship of believers. I don't really like to make some of these people. Uh, you enjoy Christian songs. But I also like secular songs. Because songs, I mean, you like music and... and but you see, all these things you see, somebody may like the word because it's interesting from an English literature point of view. Somebody might like coming to fellowship believers because they like hanging around with guys. Somebody may like music. But again, a different person will come to the word and like it because it is the word of God. It's speaking to me deeply. People may come to the fellowship believers and say that I love it because these are my brothers and sisters in the faith. And we pray for one another. Another person may go to the worship and say, this is a time when I can just pour out my heart and worship in spirit and truth. So you can have similar things, huh? but you have different experiences and how you interact with them. 
So I suppose, I mean, if you do have the Holy Spirit in you, um, it is maybe, can I say this? You start to see yourself grow. First of all, you need to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, which means you surrender your life to Him. And then over time, over time, you start to pray, you start to hear, you start to love. And this is an over time sort of thing. But if you find that your, your growth is stagnant and there is no... And in fact, it reverses. You don't go to church, you don't like to fellowship, you don't like to listen to Christian songs, you don't like to worship and all this sort of thing. Then you need to uh, really call on God and maybe talk to pastors or talk to myself or talk to the people, the leaders, to actually help you through. The Holy Spirit should, should help you to see that you are growing. Huh? Uh, and it may take a long time. And I want you to be kind to one another. Just because that I have I behave this way doesn't mean that this is a standard you should achieve at 38 years of age. Because you may have been struggling with addiction, you may be struggling with serious, so difficult issues in life. Uh, may not be too dramatic, may be minor to the eyes of the world, but it is something to your side. And because you struggle through all this, uh, your progression is actually major but you're not like preaching and worship leading and prayer leading or whatever it is. But you're very quiet, but actually there are big breakthroughs happening in your life. So I don't want us to, to, to imagine that uh, spiritual maturity looks like Terence, looks like uh, Raymond or Eugene or Natasha or whoever. Spiritual maturity is God's uh, work in you. It is a God's unique work in you. But you definitely should see whether you are progressing in your faith. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Okay, follow up question. What does it mean by worshipping in spirit and in truth? Spirit is where, um, again, there are many different definitions of this, but then the spirit part, I would say, is where you. How is it? Let me do it the other way. If you worship in truth, in truth could be like the hymns, where there's a lot of truth. There are major truths and amazing grace. It is where my soul. Truth, 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 truth. And then you can sing loud, but there is no, there is nothing happening in your heart. There's nothing happening in your life. You can be standing there. And I'm not saying that you, if you stand there and, and whatever it is, doesn't mean that you're worshipping. Somebody can be lifting their hands up and jumping up and down and they're still not worshipping. Because there is nothing in their heart that is touched by God that is, that is, touched by, by the Holy Spirit. And on the other hand, let's just say that you have spirit and no truth. Now, this is the part where I'm also scared for the, for the church. Because you can be jumping up and down, and it's not that there's a lot of spirit, but you don't know what you're worshipping. Alright? People just say, come on, lift your hands up. You lift your hands up. Come on, let's go. Yeah, let's go. And then you're all very happy. But then, if I ask you the question, what are you worshipping? Who are you worshipping? Or I ask you, Related question, which I like to ask now, huh? and maybe I'll ask the leaders one at a time on that. Awesome. I tell you the question now. Right? Very easy question. What is the gospel? Yeah. I think that's a very good question. If you can answer it, and then I'll look at your eyes, I'll see your face, whether you've got tears coming out. But the whole concept of the good news, the gospel, what Christ has done on the cross, should, should tell you whether you actually know the God that you're worshipping. Yeah. Because if you know the gospel, this is what I really believe. If you know the gospel, you worship in spirit. And then you desire to have truth. And you worship in spirit and in truth. Not just the spirit, not just the truth, but both. Yeah. Alright? Do we still have a thought? Yes, I'm trying to do that. Uh, then like, uh, one here, uh, how to hold on tight to God when, you, when we are in a relationship? Or how to hold on tight on God in a relationship? Not sure what's the question about. Um, if believer and believer, we have a different problem. If believer and believer holding on tight to God should be uh, something that both believers want, that both believers really desire in their relationship, and uh, they will they will do so naturally. No, I can't say naturally or so. 
both believers will say that we want to grow closer to God. And then uh, they can make steps towards it. You can pray together. You can read the Bible together. You can serve in ministry together. Um, you can share about spiritual things together. If you don't want those formal ways, you can just pray. Because sometimes you can talk about nonsense. I mean, you can just talk about all sorts of stuff. But then sometimes you talk about how good is our God. I mean, it's not formal. We don't schedule 7.30 prayer meeting or whatever it is. But you're talking about spiritual things. And then as we do that, we are actually encouraging one another and then slowly moving towards uh, God. And then, yeah, sometimes, again, in relationships, I don't want to formalize it too much. There is nice things about structure, like devotion time, prayer time, all these other things. It's very, very good. But sometimes just things like, you know that the person is going through a hard time, and just say things like, let us pray together. And then you pray for the person. I just pray and pray and pray, God help him and so on. And I think that is both people trying to move towards God together. Remember that uh, the Christian faith is a journey. So you never really reach there until you die. So you're always walking this journey. Huh? So that, that's, uh, hopefully that's helpful. Uh, it's a question from, someone who's not here, but uh, this person sent in the question. What is the purpose of PBC Youth? What is the purpose of PBCU? I think what, we'll, what I'll do is that I'll post this question up and ask the leaders to answer uh, and then they'll give an answer of what is the purpose of PBCU. And then we'll have a read of their answers. <laughs> that one is a very, very good question. I have an answer in my mind, uh, but uh, we, will, we will see what's the answer from the leaders. Maybe next week we'll see what happens. Alright, how do we know what we have done is satisfying to God? Because the word of God have already uh, explained what is satisfying to God. The whole, one of the major purposes of uh, reading the Bible is to find how we can satisfy or give delight to God. You want to delight God. You want to make God happy. And you say that, God, I want to know how to make you happy because you've done such a wonderful, 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 wonderful thing to me. And then the word of God then says that this is the way that delights the Lord. Alright? So, obedience, not sacrifice. You have all these things inside. And then uh, it's a journey. There's so many things. In fact, the entire journey of a Christian is growing to, to satisfy, to, to give pleasure, to delight God. And then when you feel God's pleasure, it gives you so much pleasure. Right? So that's the Christian journey. How you know? You read the Bible. Um, how you guys? Still want a few more or want to stop? What's this question? <laughs> yeah, tell me. Oh. Alright, uh, we'll do two more questions. Can pick, pick one more. Pick, just pick one more first here. Okay. If, okay. if a person claims to have faith but does not do the work, is the person actually saved? And what does it mean by work? Uh, if the person, sorry, repeat the question. If the person claims to have faith. If the person claims to have faith but doesn't do the work. If the person actually says, and, oh. and what is work? What is there is work? Oh, this one you look James. This one you look at James chapter 2, four. This is the question of faith and works. I think it's a James 2.14. Okay. 14 to 17, I suppose. So what happens is that uh, James 2.14 to 17 says, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith, but does not have works? I think that's basically the question. Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one who says to him, Go in peace, be warm and filled, without giving him the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, it does not have works, is dead. I think this one is where you uh, refer to the Sermon on the Plain, where we also say that a good tree produces good fruit, a bad tree produces bad fruit. So our focus should not be on the works. Actually, in James, the, the focus itself is on faith. So when you are a good tree, you will bear good fruits. That's what the promise of Jesus. 
that when you have a good tree, you will definitely bear good fruits. So the question for you is, what tree are you? And uh, if you ask the question, is the person saved? That actually, that's one of the questions that I don't think is uh, helpful. Because we can never know. Am I saved? Am I saved? You don't know, right? I could be pretending. I could be pretending for 10, 20 years. The person who is a beggar on the street and then maybe is uh, stealing stuff and so on, is he saved? Maybe every time he steals, uh, he's crying before the Lord for 10, 20 uh, hours a day because he just cannot help himself because he has a mental illness. But he steals because he feels, uh, feels compelled to. But maybe he goes to the Lord and says, Lord, I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. I am a sinner. Most people would say that that person is not saved. He goes to jail, in and out of jail, everybody curses him. And, and, and me, for example, people would say, I'm saved. How do you know anyone is saved? Nobody knows. But we can have indicators of faith. So the works that we do are indicators. But those are only indicators. You understand or not? They don't confirm. The only thing that you will know is when you actually die. So actually more, more important, actually, I would say, is that whether well, first, are you saved? That is more important. Are you saved? Second one is that you're trying to help someone in their journey of faith. But as you help someone in their journey of faith, I think the last sermon by Frappina was helpful, you are not the saviour. Which means that you also just encourage the person, help the person, pull the person through. The Bible says the Bible never says that you're supposed to save anyone. The Bible says that you can pull the person out of the fire, but that doesn't mean that you actually save the person from the depths of hell. Just saying that you know you encourage the person, preach the gospel, the person's convicted, then the person pulls out. But you never save anyone anyway. So I think the more better question, because you have people committed suicide, you have people all these things, is he saved, is he saved, is he not saved? I think um, the what is the gospel? The gospel is where you have uh, you have create, you have committed sins, you are a sinner, and then God um, is holy, and if you come to God, you cannot, because a holy God and a sinful man. And you cannot preach that thing. So what happens is that Jesus came and by by his sacrifice, a perfect sacrifice, so therefore all your sins are forgiven. And therefore we can now have the righteousness of God on us and we can go to God. So if you understand the gospel, right, I think these type of questions are uh, easier to understand and the importance of it also shifts. Oh. Okay, the last question is interesting. Does God create aliens? There are tons of galaxies out there. Is there any life forms in other galaxies? I think it's a, it is a valid question. It is a seriously valid question. Because actually as a Christian, they, I want to remind everybody, huh? I mean, questions are questions. Are questions. Consider this. Consider this question, alright? The apologists, the Christian apologists have actually answered this thing. If we say, if we say that life forms right is created randomly, because that's what the atheists believe, that we spontaneously through evolution we have actually gained some form of intelligence. Now what happens then is that there should be other intelligent life forms out, out there. Because it is random. You understand or not? One meaning that if I shake, 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 then got one human race and you have an earth. What happens that if I shake, 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 a billion times? Surely there is one more earth, right? You understand? It's random, huh? everything, ta -ta 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 -ta, and then you have all these amino acids, are proteins, or whatever it is, the atmosphere, you have all these uh, guys. I mean, surely, surely, certainly, you have a billion trolls. You throw the dice a billion times. Troll, 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 troll. For sure, there will be another life form somewhere. And yet, this is the interesting part. People have been studying the stars and trying to, because if there is life form, this is a theory, huh? if there is life form, it means that they are able to master uh, telecommunication. They are able to master radio waves, radio waves. And somehow the scientists will explain to me, I don't, I'm not too sure, but this is what I read. Those waves will reach different parts of the galaxy. And that's what they're studying, which means that they're having this huge satellite dish, uh, this dish, and they're receiving all these signals and they're trying to hear SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. SETI, for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, they've been trying to hear any patterns from the world and they have found nothing. 
Which means that it's not one billion, you know, do you know how many stars there are? It's not one billion stars. They are don't know I don't know how to count how many stars there are. And they turn the dish around and they cannot see, they cannot find any evidence of any life form. But they must be if life was created randomly. Alright? If life was created randomly, there must be some form of life. They may not be able to travel to us, but the, the effects of their civilization should be heard here. So, that is the answer from the Christian apologist to answer that life did not spontaneously happen. God created life. That is uh, what the person was saying. But there's lots of articles on this. I just browse through them. Alright, so I think uh, we close this session. It's nearly 6 o'clock. And uh, I just want us all to, to just understand this one important point. This is a very, very important point. The Q&A is fun. I enjoy myself. And uh, if, you want to ans if you want more in-depth in answers, uh, we can have conversations. But the most important thing is the Gospel. Preaching in out, giving you these books, giving you this Q&A. The whole point is for the Gospel. What is the Gospel? And the Gospel is not a theoretical concept. The Gospel is where that you, all right, you guys, each and every single one of you, I want you guys to understand this. You all sin. And you know this. Because if I tell you today, today, uh, tomorrow, just say this, tomorrow, don't do anything wrong. Nothing. Zero. Do not think anything wrong. Do not feel anything wrong. Do not do anything wrong. I tried one day. I failed after one hour of waking up. I cannot. Because your eyes, if you know what is right and wrong, if you know what's right and wrong, you know immediately when you look at a girl, for two seconds more, it is lust. <laughs> you understand or not? You know what I'm saying is it your mouth, huh? your mouth will sin. When you text message, huh? how many times are huh, you text message and your words are careless? Do you know that careless words are judged? Because you are not sympathetic, sympathetic to the person who is receiving it. Your careless words have hurt people. Under God's eyes, huh, you have sinned. So all of us sin, you see. But the goodness of God is this. That Christ has died for all our sins. And because of that, we can enter heaven. Where our sins are cleared, and then we can rejoice, we can sing songs, we can talk about spirit and truth, we can talk about good works. Because, and only because of the gospel. If you do not have the gospel, you have no part of heaven. Alright? It's very clear. So come, let me just uh, pray. Let us uh, give this time. I want you guys to just uh, close your eyes, bow your heads. I'll give you some time, one minute, two minutes, to just be quiet. And I want you guys to understand. If you have questions and answers for today, very good. But if you have questions to God, talking about what is salvation, what is the gospel, what, who is God, I ask right now that you ask God himself. Right? And may God give that answer to you. Alright? So just quietly pray, and then I will uh, close in prayer.